One Way, After Long Rain, written at Wanchuan Village. After days of rain, smoke rises late above the woods, where farmers are steaming greens and millet. Egrets fly across the misty paddy fields. Orioles call from treetops under summer clouds. In the quiet of these hills at dawn, hibiscus is unfolding. Under a pine tree, mallow seeds suffice to break my fast. The older man no longer vies with others for position. Why then does this seagull still eye me with suspicion? So we move on to the third of the of of the out of four of um, of Wang Wei's heptasyllabic regulated verse, which are included in this anthology. And in this poem, we feel closer to home and closer to the traditional expectations we have about Wang Wei. So this is a poem that, as you have seen, depicts a rural, bucolic, uh, pastoral type of landscape. It's clearly a praise and a description of the retired life. And there's a very clear indication that uh, Wang Wei seems to have renounced office and seems to be enjoying now a life of ease, but out of power, especially in the last couplet of the poem. So, after long rain, written at Wan Chuan village. So Wan Chuan, uh, which can be translated, I think, as Wheel River, is the place where, where Wang Wei's estate was. He had a big estate, you know, he came from a wealthy family. And just uh, south of the capital, Chang'an, at the foot of the, um, of, of the Qingling Mountains, he had, of Chungshan Mountains, sorry, he had this very big estate. Mm, sometimes it's called Lan Tian uh, Estate instead of Wan Chuan, uh, because that was the name of the region. And uh, in his later years, uh, Wang Wei spent a lot of time there. So the poetry about Wang Chuan is generally retirement poetry, natural descriptive poetry. In fact, he has a cycle of poems that I think we've commented previously, uh, a series of Wang River Valley poems mm, with Pei Di mm, that are among his most famous works of poetry. That's a curious thing. This Wang in Wang Chuan is different from the Wang in his own surname. Okay then, so this is a poem that is a nature poem. Um, it's not a completely unhumanized nature. It's rather a rural, bucolic sort of nature with um, indirect views of um, humans or farmers working in the fields along with birds and other creatures. It has a strong, strong retirement theme with, with Taoist images. Remember, um, Wang Wei was not necessarily Taoistically inclined. He was more of a Buddhist, but... Many of the attitudes of Buddhism and Taoism overlap, mainly this idea that retiring from the world is good. And uh, I think, yeah, I think that's the main thing we can say about the poem. This feels like the stereotypical Wang Wei poem in many aspects, although perhaps it would be even more um, fitting into the mold if there was no human presence. That is, the, the typical Wang Wei poem is one in which we get a depiction of nature where the human presence is conspicuously absent, especially the individual subjectivity and point of view. Okay, then let's take a look at the poem as we usually do, couplet by couplet. First couplet. After days of rain, smoke rises late above the woods, where farmers are steaming greens and millet. So... This poem is set in summer. This is this becomes clearer further on, especially in the um, in the fourth line. Summer in China, as opposed to, for example, here in the West, at least in my region of the West, in, in Spain. Uh, summer is a very wet season in in China and in Japan. It's hot but extremely wet, and it rains a lot. In fact, part of the summer is sometimes called the rainy season, which is a period in which uh, Buddhist monks. Hmm, uh, remain inside uh, their 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 temples. It's also in Southeast Asia, which really don't have um, the normal seasons, but have a dry season and a, a wet season. Both of them hot. But uh, so so we're here in the in the warm season. 
It's been raining a lot, and after some days of rain, water falling down, you have the opposite effect, something going up. In this case, it's smoke. Smoke is rising above the woods. Why is smoke rising above the woods? The second line tells us. Farmers are preparing a meal. They're cooking vegetables, yeah? so uh, millet and greens, the typical food of, 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 of the poor people. Uh, so we get this bucolic scene. Yeah, the rain has stopped, the smoke is rising in the forest, people are eating. Well, the, the image of uh, smoke rises late above the woods is a bit confusing for me because uh, other images in the poem seem to point to, to the time of day being different, unless we're getting a juxtaposition of different images from different parts of the day. So uh, another poet, uh, I'll read another version of, of this poem at the end of, 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 the, of, of, of this recording, but uh, in another version of the poem, instead of um, uh, smoke rising late, it's implied that smoke is rising slowly. So again, as usual, the first couplet usually you know, sets the background here. We have the title, and we have a bucolic scene to start with. Smoke rising in the forest, after the rains have stopped, from farmers having you know, a little snack or, or a meal uh, between or after work. Second couplet. So the second couplet moves us strictly into nature elements. In fact, the second couplet includes birds, uh, on, on, on a natural background, and uh, the third couplet includes plants that the poetic persona is going to, um, to relate with. So second couplet, egrets fly across the misty paddy fields, orioles call from treetops under summer clouds. So the parallelism is pretty clear. You have first, uh, I imagine you could call it a horizontal image, of the egrets flying through the paddy fields. So paddy fields are growing. This again indicates us that it's summer. Uh, the, the rice paddies have big plants, but it's still not time to, to collect them. So you can imagine these white figures floating between the mist and between the green. So it was a nice image, you know, pretty, pretty um, supernatural even, with these white ghosts in the white mist over the green. And uh, the orioles call from treetops under summer clouds. And this is a more vertical image. And uh, the first one was visual. This one is um, oral. So you don't see the orioles. You hear them, well, although they might be seen, calling from the treetops under summer clouds. So the, this is vertical. You have the summer clouds on top. You have the orioles at the treetops also relatively on top. The sound is coming down. So mist, clouds, egrets, orioles. Uh, treetops, paddy fields. So, you know, the parallelism, flying, calling. The parallelism is quite evident. So we get this background of birds in nature, whether they're flying, whether they're singing. They paint uh, a nice picture over a background of, um, of, of treetops and summer clouds or misty paddy fields. Third couplet. In the quiet of these hills at dawn, Hibiscus is unfolding. Under a pine tree, mallow seeds suffice to break my fast. So in the th third couplet, now we get two images of nature, two flowers, or, 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 or flowery, vegetable-like products, the hibiscus and the mallow seeds. And you also get the pine tree, if you wish. But the pine tree is rather, you know, this is also a parallelistic couplet. So pine is going with mountains, uh, yeah, exactly, with the hills, we could say. In the quiet of these hills, parallels under, and, uh, and so on and so forth. Yeah. The hibiscus parallels uh, the, 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 the mallow seeds. So we get the image in this couplet of the things that the retired scholar official, who is the poetic persona of this poem, is doing. He's living in nature. He's not in office, apparently. You know, he's just enjoying nature. And what does he do in nature? Basically, uh, at dawn, he walks freely. He roams over the hills, looking at the orioles opening up. Uh, sorry, at the hibiscus flowers opening up, which, you know, they open up in summer. And they're pretty beautiful, pretty... Uh, this is a pretty nice sightseeing activity. And when he's hungry, after he has been roaming perhaps all morning uh, through the natural landscape, 
he finds some mallow seeds, you know, growing at the foot of pine trees, and that's enough for eating. He doesn't need any more food, you know, anything stronger or heavier. You know, just this is the food of our, of, 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 the, of, our, of, of hermits and of ascetic practices of people who live in nature, disconnected from the world. So these images clearly point to uh, the poetic persona as a person who has quit the world. This will become even more clear in the last couplet, but it's, you know, it's included here. Uh, if the first two couplets really just set the background of nature, the end of humans, but, but not the poet in nature, uh, the third couplet presents us the poet himself in nature, and through his enjoyment of eating, uh, eating uh, mallow seeds and watching hibiscuses, it is clearly pointed that, you know, he, he is a hermit, he has retired from, from the world. Finally, the last uh, couplet, which, you know, punches the line in. This old man no longer vies with others for position. Why then does this seagull still eye me with suspicion? So, if we had any doubts, the last line clearly tells us that the poet, the poetic persona, is an old man who lives in retirement. He no longer vies with others for position. He just wants to lead the quiet retired life of the retired scholar official uh, slash hermit. But the poem ends with a little surprise, you know, it's a bit rhetorical, is why then does the seagull still eye me with suspicion? So the last couplet has many references to Taoist images and texts, basically mm, some, some stories and topics taken from the Chuangzi and uh, the Liezu. So the no longer vying with others for position is more literally something like not struggling with others for occupying the mat. And this refers a story of, of the Changzhu, as I said, of, of, of a follower of Lao Tzu called Zhang Zhu, uh, who before meeting his, his, his teacher was quite an arrogant person. And uh, you know, when he visited an inn, others automatically uh, um, cleared the mat uh, for, for, for him for seating because he was seen as you know, the arrogant and person with authority. This person changed after being rebuked by, uh, by, by Lao Tzu. And the next time he, he happened you know, to, to, to visit a, an inn, uh, no longer did anybody um, give him pride of place. But, you know, uh, they, they, they ended up daring to struggle with him for a place on the mat. Yeah, so this is in the Chuang Tzu. But this is clearly an image of, you know, I am no longer struggling with the mat, which is I am no longer struggling with the world, with worldly ambitions. And the last image, why are the seagulls uh, eyeing me with suspicion? This is a reference to another Taoist story, included this time in the Liezu. So there was this man who used to roam freely with the gulls by the sea. He had no intention of hurting them, so the gulls came to him. And, you know, he was leading the natural life in harmony with nature. But one day his father asked him to catch one of the seagulls for him. And when the man went to the beach the next day, the gulls refused to fly to him. So you know, this is a typical Taoist parable on how when human desires, especially human society's desires, ambitions, corruptions, mm, impinge on the natural, um, you know, the harmony with nature is broken. Yeah? The, that, that boy, that man or boy who lived in harmony with nature, who was not perceived as a threat, becomes corrupted, partially by his father's desire of profit, of, of capturing the birds, and he no longer can, can connect with those uh, seagulls. So you know, the idea is, um, you know, a person who has been corrupted cannot, by society, by culture, by ambition, uh, by worldly beliefs or worldly objectives, you know, has broken his connection with nature. And uh, here, rhetorically, uh, one way is asking, I have broken completely with, with that world, with the red dust, with ambition, with office, with court. Why don't the seagulls trust me yet? They should, because, you know, now I'm a different man. So, interesting poem. And I said I had another translation. Let me read you this one. I think the second, I wouldn't be able to say which is better or which is worse. I would say the second translation feels a bit more literal than the one I have just read you. So this one is called Written After Prolonged Rain at the Wang River Estate. A prolonged rain in the empty woods, cook fire smoke rises slowly. As we steam pigweed and stew millet, 
to feed those on the eastern fields. Over vast and boundless paddies fly the white herons. In dense dark summer trees warble yellow orioles. Within the mountains, practicing peace, I watch the morning hibiscus. Beneath the pines, in a cleansing fast, I cut off a dewy sunflower. The rustic old man has done with the struggle to win a place on the mat. Seagull, for what reason are you still suspicious of me? So the general tone is very similar. One thing that you probably will have noticed in the translation is, you know, the subjects of the lines, you know, are always ambiguous because Chinese, sel- and, and even more so Chinese poetry, seldom includes pronouns. The verbs don't include indication of number, of tense. So, so it's sometimes not clear who is doing what in the line. So, for example, in the second line, in, in the, the first poem we read, it, the translation clearly um, painted the poetic persona as looking at farmers steaming greens and millet, but not being part of them, or not doing that. Whereas in this translation, the poet is included among those, the poetic persona is among those who are steaming the pigweed and uh, the millet to give to the farmers. So, but, but this is, as I said, this is, you know, pretty, pretty typical. Uh, for example, the number of, of, of birds that appear in lines uh, three and four. So uh, the plural is, is included here. So white herons, yellow orioles in the second translation. Um, but, but again, I think a lot of the time there are no indicators of number. So it could be one yeah, in, in many poems like this. So anyway, quite an interesting poem and more in line with traditional expectations about one way's uh, poetry and subject matter.